Well, good evening, everybody. Hey, Amen. Welcome to Harry Baptist Church tonight. Let's all stand and sing the chorus. What a mighty God we serve. As we start our church service tonight, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. And what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. And what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Page number 20, page 20. We'll sing the first, second, and the last of all. Hail the power of Jesus' name. Page number 20. Let's all join in and sing. Page 20. All hail the power of Jesus' name. We'll sing on the first, second, and the last. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate for. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. The chosen seed of Israel's race, be ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. On the last, oh, that way yonder sacred rock we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him, Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him, Lord of all. Page 486. Page 486. We'll also sing the first, second, and the last. Of I am resolved, page 486. I am resolved no longer to linger on the first. I am resolved no longer to linger. Jump by the world's delight. Things that are higher and things that are nobler. These have alert my sight. I will hasten to hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one and he is the just one. He had the words of life. I will hasten to him. Hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to. On the last, sing it out. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the path of sin. Friends may oppose me and foes may be set. I still will I enter in. I will hasten to hasten so glad and free. Jesus is the greatest highest. I will come to thee. Amen. Maybe soon. All right. Good singing here tonight. And great to see each and every one of you make it out to our Sunday evening service. I'm thankful for those of you that are tuning in on the internet. And I want to encourage all the Heritage Baptist Church to share our hbcgallion.com webpage and to share it to, uh, to as many as you can to get the gospel. We appreciate that. I invite everyone back Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, our Bible study time. Every Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Hope you can make it back for that. And it's great to have uh, Dwayne and uh, Barbara Meadows, if I got that right, I think. Great to have them and the whole troop. And to have them visiting here with us tonight. 
a few folks to pray for. Keep Naomi Rayborn, of course, pray for her leukemia. And, uh, several folks have been praying for. Uh, Bobby Young also is having some health difficulties that and asked for prayer for, for Bobby. Uh, Kurt was on the men's tonight working, helping out, uh, doing some cleanup duties. And so Brother Gilding's pitching in for us. He's going to read our scripture. He's going to come up and read First Kings chapter 12 for us. He's going to read the scripture, First Kings chapter 12, and then pray. I'd like to just say I was glad when they said let us come into the house of the Lord. I really enjoyed being here. Uh, when we face the world all week long and I get to be with other Christians and uh, I just want to tell you guys I love you very much. I think you are often praise the Lord for this church. Let's uh, read uh, chapter 12, uh, verse 1. And Rehoabam went to Shechem and for all Israel will come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jehoabam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon and Jehoiakim, dwelt in Egypt. Then they sent and called him, and Jehoiakim, and all the congregation of Israel came and spake under Jehoiakim, saying, The father made our yoke grievous, now therefore make thou thy grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke which he put upon us. Later, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. And King Jehovah consulted with the old man that stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, and said, How do you advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and will serve them and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be the servants forever. But he forsook, forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, and which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that ye may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make thy yoke which thy father did, but I'm not to us later. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's horns. And now, whereas my father did lay you with heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastened you with whip, but I will chasten you with scorpions. In verse 18, then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tri tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the people that came out tonight. Thank you for the people that are on the internet listening to us. I just pray for um, give Pastor Nablet the wisdom and the words to speak to us tonight. And Lord, help us not to only be hearers of your words, but also doers, Lord. You know we're in the last days. We're in a battle, Lord. Um, against Satan, and Lord, we read the back of the book, so we know who wins, Lord. And we just praise you for everything that you're doing and continue to do. And um, like I said, there's you're a good God. You're the God of the valley and the God of the mountains. We just thank you and praise you for everything you're doing and continue to do. May we see souls saved before it's too late. We want to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. So let's stand one more time and turn our hymnals to page number 109, page 109. Standing on the promises, page 109. Say on the first and on the last. Standing on the promises of Christ, I came through eternal ages, let it pray, says the rain, glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God, standing on, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, 
standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God on the land. Standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit. I am resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, we're standing on promises of God, my Savior. Standing, I'm standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Before you sit down, let's all sing this chorus together. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, and lift my voice. Let's all sing it nice and loud. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you can may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord. See you, church. And I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you have. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your head. Amen. Praise the Lord. Maybe see. All right, good singing again here tonight. The First Kings chapter 12. Turn your Bibles back there, if you would, please. First Kings chapter number 12. I uh, touched base this morning on what the Bible says about abortion and hope that everyone in the building would back me up on what I said. And maybe for those that maybe tuned in on the Internet, hopefully got... Some maybe got their eyes awakened a little bit, looking at what the Word of God says. So, while I was on a roll, I thought I might as well go straight to the subject of taxes tonight and uh, see what the Bible says about taxes. And how many of you can probably agree with me right off the bat, we're overtaxed too much in Mary. And uh, I believe we are. I'm going to give us some scripture tonight here. And uh, being overtaxed, and it's not quite equality, you could say, and we're going to look at the Word of God in it and see what the Bible says on the subject here of taxes. Uh, Solomon, 1 Kings chapter number 12 here, uh, his son Rehoboam has been trained by Solomon to be a great king. He had the potential, great instruction, but he, unfortunately, he became a terrible king. I'm going to have Kurt read for me a couple individual verses as we follow along in our King James Bibles tonight. If you don't have that, just kind of listen close. We're going to let a, a couple of these verses in 1 Kings 12, I might make a comment or two, and then move on with uh, the message. Kurt, if you don't mind, just start out, look at verse number 6. Just read 6, and then I'm going to read verse 7. All right, very good. Starting out initially here, Rehoboam did a wise thing. He consulted in the in the older generation, those that kind of was there before him. And how many can agree with me? That's a wise thing to do. Yeah, consult with someone who's already been down that path of life before, and he did that, even though he was the king. When I became the pastor here initially in two thousand two, uh, often I'd seek the advice of. Uh, older pastors, 
Uh, my pastor in Florida for several times, I asked him, not just him, but several other pastors, I asked them, I called them up and been down the, the road before, saying, you know, what would you do? And, and I, often they had given me advice, you know, sometimes as a pastor, only you know what's right for your church. But I was young into the pastorate again, and I'd ask them, and that's what Rehoboam did a wise thing to do here. He asked the generation before him, the older generation, what they what he thinks that they they tell him what he should do. And he was wise in doing that then, but jump on down to verse number seven. Very good. The wise generation, they told Rehoboam, here's what you do. You need to simply be a servant. A servant. How many would love for politicians today to have the mentality of being a servant? That's what they told Rehoboam. He needed to be as a servant. A servant. And it goes on there, and he said, you know, speak kind words. Be be good to people. Be good to people. Have their best interest in mind. How would I like to see a politician have the people's best interest in mind and not their own? And be a servant. That's what needs to be done. That's what they advised Rehoboam to do. Verse 11 then, Kurt. Harm in God's people is what Rehoboam ended up deciding to do. Because not only did he ask the older generation what to do, he also tried to get advice from somebody else, the younger generation. And he chose that wrong advice instead. And I believe the Bible simply teaches here that no one should be voted into office. It's going to bring harm simply to God's people. Thomas Jefferson said this, when government fears the people, there is liberty. When people fear the government, there is tyranny. Again, the old generation had it, had it right. How many remember back in the days, a lot of you in the 1970s, remember the 1970s? Few of you maybe weren't quite around yet, but the 1970s, there was a president, his name was Jimmy Carter then. I remember the presidential days of Jimmy Carter, uh, the peanut farmer from Georgia. And uh, Jimmy Carter uh, did, kind of you could say, a bad job, a bad job. Uh, not because he was a peanut farmer from Georgia, that's nothing to do with it. He did a bad job because the economy went in the tank, if you remember that. There was gas shortages. The military was depressed. And uh, the, uh, the economy was not only bad, but our strength and power that America stood for for years was very much weakening. And all of a sudden, during that time frame, we had some prisoners that were in Iran that we couldn't get back, bottom line. And there was... Someone that came into the power by the name of President Ronald Reagan. President Ronald Reagan came into power then in 1980. And all of a sudden, within days, because of his power and strength, and Iran knew that he wasn't messing around, all of a sudden our prisoners were no longer prisoners, and we brought them home. Thank God for that. He did something else. Not only did our military become strong, but... He lowered taxes. He lowered taxes. There wasn't a gas shortage then. I remember standing in, or in line with my parents and the gas lines they had then. There weren't no longer like the gas shortage then. And the inflation quit booming up and the economy got better. And our military got stronger and our respect worldwide came back to where it was supposed to be. And this is because there was a, a, a lowering of taxes simply as he had promised. Isn't it great though when you do have a politician that also keeps his promises? 
How many have heard a politician say, no more taxes? Ever heard them say that before? And they didn't keep their promises. Remember, Republican President George Bush I said, read my lips, no more taxes. I remember him saying that. What did he do? He raised taxes. Right. There's taxes here. There's so many taxes. In fact, I wrote down a few of these. I'll, I'll, I'll expect a good quiz grade from you when I'm done at the end of the night. These taxes consist of, there's a personal income tax. There's a payroll tax. There's a corporate income tax. Social security tax. Federal and state income tax. There's a Medicare tax. There's a death tax. There's an estate tax. A generation skipping transfer tax. A fuel tax. A toll road tax. A road usage tax. And that's just my left column. Let me go to my right. A local tax, a property tax, a, bill, a building servant tax, a sales tax, a sin tax, an estate tax, a capital gains tax, a luxury tax, a local income tax, a recreational tax, a real estate tax, vehicle sales tax, a tariff import and export tax, an unemployment tax, a telephone excess tax. How many got every one of those down? I just said. All right. How many can agree with me? There's too much taxes going on today. I got it. That's what I was getting at. Too much taxes that are going on. Statistics tell us that if you would do this, if you would work for a certain number of days and get your taxes out of the way first and then start making money, here I wrote about four or five different states. Here's the number of days you would work and then you start making money. And in Illinois, You'd work for 113 days to start making money. Connecticut, 128 days. Alaska, the smallest, 88 days. In California, for the fruits and nuts, where my daughter's at now, 120 days. 120 days, and then you would start making money. The question is kind of asked, why do we give our government so much power? Just kind of let them do as they please. Well, I believe you can kind of take this back a little bit to a manifesto. It's called the Humanist Manifesto. It came out in 1933 and came back again in the 1970s. It said of various things like this in the Humanist Manifesto. It says there needs to be an, an absence of God in the Humanist Manifesto. The pushing of humanism says that there's, the prayer is out of date. How many believe the opposite? Prayer is never out of date. God still answers prayer. It says salvation is harmful. It says that there must be an international authority and provide massive technology help, educational help, medical and financial help, and include birth control techniques need to be pushed. That's the communist, humanist manifesto. So what is communism? Stay with me just for a little bit. Communism is this. It says, to eliminate the middle class, and its goal is to have two classes. Now, there are some politicians in America today that believe that. And they'll never come out and say it. Communism says there has to be two classes. One, the very rich, and two, the very poor. And the middle class is to be done away with. Now, you'll never have a politician on either side, Republican or Democrat, that will come up and say Man, you know what? I believe in this communist human manifesto, and I believe in doing away with the middle class. They would never say that, but their policies will tell you different. Karl Marx, one of the fathers of communism, came out in 1970, or excuse me, 1875, and said this: Every person should contribute to society to the best of their ability. 
and consume from society proportionate to their needs regardless of how much they have contributed. Now, many people look at others and say, you know, I want and what I want and I don't get, I think the government should tell me what I need to get and give it to me. I don't believe that government is too big today. I don't believe that government interferes in our business too much of the time. And even including this thing of taxes. Well, I'm going to ask this question before we move on. Turn to Malachi chapter 3 in your Bibles. If you have your King James Bible, turn to Malachi chapter number 3. What is God's program for the church? What is God's program for the church? Just so you're with me, how many again agree with me? There's too many taxes going on in America. You with me on that? Okay. What is God's program for the church? Though? Malachi chapter 3. Pick it up in verse number 8. I'm going to ask Brother Ken to read verse 8. And Kurt read verse 9. And Ken read verse 10. And Kurt read verse 11 for us. Alternate verses. Malachi 3, 8 to 11. All right, God's program for the church is called the tithe. Now, this isn't new to us in here, and I know I'm talking to the choir mostly, but a couple Wednesday nights ago, preachers often repeat themselves for the reasons I stated. But the tithe, how much, what percentage church is the tithe? Ten, ten percent. God's program is that everybody in the church is commanded by God to participate, and that's ten percent. So what do you do? You bring ten percent of your money to your local storehouse, to your local church. Does that just mean the senior citizen is to do that, church? No. That just mean the pastor and deacon board is to do that. No. Does that mean the middle-aged senior citizen is to do that? No, that means everybody. Everybody that gets a wage or gets money, 10% of that money is supposed to go to the local source of the church, and that's called the tithe. You can give above that. In fact, it goes on and says you to give above it. The command is 10%. It says give tithes and offerings to your local storehouse. Now, God says this in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first. The kingdom of God is righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the first thing we need to do with our money is to give our tithe. And I don't believe, according to the word of God, that the government needs to give more than what we give in our tithe to the church. Now, how many of you, you like to go out to eat? Let me see your hands. Let's go out to eat. Okay. I don't know if anybody went out to eat today. Anybody? You're, Wives, your husband take you out to eat today? Anybody? No one? No one got taken out to eat today. Yeah. But if you did, how many say, you know, I'd love for someone to take me to Red Lobster? How many would like that? Red Lobster? How about Outback? Outback? How about Texas Roadhouse? Got some fans there. How about the Golden Corral? Any? Oh. That's the band's going for out. Olive Garden? Olive Garden? How about anywhere just take you out to eat? Right. Anywhere. Yeah. Now, what happens, though, you go out to eat, you get someone to come to you, a waiter, a waitress, whatever they, they'll take your order to bring your drink to you. They'll get your order and they'll take it to the kitchen to bring your food back to you. They'll come back. Can I, can I, can I help you? And, you know, you ask for ketchup, you ask for, you, know, you need A1, how many A1 fans do we have in here? 
A1, you A1 for that steak or whatever. Then you need your dessert and you bring it back. And then they bring you a bill. And at the end of the bill, often a place like the Red Lobsters or the Outbacks, they have a percentage at the bottom. The percentage is a suggestion for the tip that you leave him or her. And generally, it's a, a, a command, but the general suggestion is at least, it'll say 15%, and it'll give the amount that 50% would be, or it'll say generally 18% or 20% of the tip. And we give it freely out of a kind heart because we're Christians and we're cheerful givers, right? Right, amen. But at the, when it comes to the church, how many realizes that God is never wrong? Yeah, God is never wrong. And God says, you know, I'm not asking for 15, 18, or 20 percent. I'm not asking, but I'm commanding you to give 10 percent of your money to your local storehouse. And how many realizes God is always right? He said, yeah, okay. He said, I want you to give it to your church and I want you to give it cheerfully, happily. He said, I love a cheerful giver. And that's 10%. Then your tithes and your, your, your tithe and your offerings over that. 10% don't think God commands. And I don't believe that government or anyone should come over us and say, you know what, I command more than what God offers, what God asks, what God commands of us. So how many would love for the government to say, you know what, the Bible's right, and from this point forward, I am only going to ask 9% of your money to give to Uncle Sam. How many would say amen and amen to that? Now, I believe that is biblically correct. Turn, if you would, to Psalm chapter number 11. Psalm chapter 11 and verse number 3, just for a little bit tonight. Psalm 11 and verse 3. Psalm 11 and verse number 3. What has happened today, though, is this. Government has came on, and they have pretty much tried to destroy the family. There's an on, there's a war on the nuclear family today. No, this morning's subject, the Bible's about abortion tied in with that. What happened? The government has come on today and they've tried to try to do away with the, the nuclear family. They've pushed the, the governmental agendas and government help to get society to rely on the government. Now I'm here to simply say this. If someone gets down and out, they lose a job or they just can't work for health reasons or whatever, down and out, some situation came. I mean, that's fine for you know, the government to step in. You know, according to the Word of God, that's the government is not the number one place for to help an individual, to realize that. According to the Bible, the number one place is supposed to be family. Family is supposed to take care of one another. And again, I'm not opposed to the government coming and helping someone out when they get down and out. The problem is when someone can work and they choose not to. That's when problems come on the scene. But too much of the time, the government has got people and started by LBJ in the 1960s. And it's got people to solely rely on the government instead of relying on themselves and their family. Brother Kirk, can you read Psalm chapter 11 and verse number 3 for us? And the foundation, way back in Genesis 1 and 2, the foundation is the family. Do you know there's a total onslaught against the family today? There's an onslaught against marriages. There's an onslaught against the family trying to take care of one another. And the foundation of everything in society is the family. But God's plan simply is this. God's plan is equality. And equality is always, always right. And I'd be that's percentages wise too, as far as taxes go. Tell me with me again. We are taxed too much in America. Tax too much. And God is for equality. 
It's free quality, I believe. You know, God does not expect for Ken to bring a percentage wise of 50% and Rick, Rick bring a percentage of 25% of what they bring financially to our church. God says everybody across the board is to bring how much percent? 10 percent to your church. Now, someone may give more than another. If someone, your, your annual income is $1 million. How many like that annual income? Can you get a minute on that? Yeah, annual income of $1 million. They should tithe how much percentage-wise? They should $100,000. And how much percentage-wise is? 10%. So if Kurt brings in $1 million this year, he should tithe how much? $100,000, 10%. If my son brought, man, he works hard, and he works hard this summer, he gets his construction job, and he brings in $10,000, how much should he tie this church? $1,000. And that's 10%. That's equal. That's equality. And I believe that is the tax system that should be in place and the United States of America. It should be equality. Brother King brings in $100,000. He should tithe $10,000. 10%. It should be based upon your income, percentage-wise, just the same. Again, Matthew 6.33 simply says, this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And yeah, but the subject of taxes is just another issue that Christians need to stand upon the principles of the Word of God. How many agree with me from my, my uh, message from this morning that abortion is murder? And Christians should stand up on their hind legs and say, this is what the Bible says. There's other issues that we will get into. We have so many times in the past. How many ag agree that God says marriage is with one man, with one woman for one lifetime. All right. It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Can you get a man on that? And we should stand on that principle, even though it's like not popular. You know, what I preach today, maybe everyone in the congregation, I hope everyone is with me on that. But there's probably some people that they peeked in on the internet and listened to my message. And they probably did not agree 100% of my audience on what I said. But you can never argue with the Word of God. I gave it from a biblical perspective. Tonight I bring this from a, a biblical perspective. Wouldn't it be great if the President of the United States came in and said, you know what, the new tax system, 9% across the board. That's how it's going to be. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And equality. By the way, that'd be a great thing if it's across the board to say we shouldn't punish the wealthy. You should want the you should want wealthy people to keep making more money. Because wealthy people that keeps making more money, they'll spend more money. They'll build new homes and they'll buy the yachts and you name it. And that's more jobs for the middle class that we do not simply want to do away with. Nehemiah chapter number 5, if you would, will be done. Nehemiah chapter number 5. Nehemiah chapter number 5, and look at verse number 1, the story of the walls that were being rebuilt by Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter number 5. Verse number 1, Brother Kurt, if you read Nehemiah 5.1, and then can read verse number two, Nehemiah chapter number five, in this rebuilding of the wall in the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah chapter five and verse one. All right, very good. In these two verses get this, the family unit here as having a hard time financially. Church, see if you're with me. Has there ever been one time, how old you are, 
in your entire life, at least one time, that you didn't have it the best financially. You have it the best. Okay? I mean, maybe two months, month left at the end of the money. You just didn't quite make it. Nehemiah 5, they're trying to do a work for God. They were having a hard time finding it. They wanted more money. Ever been a time in your life where you wish you had a little bit more money? They're having a hard time here, Nehemiah 5. Brother Kurt, read verse number 3 for us. Very good. Verse 3. They were mortgaging their home. Why? Because they wanted to feed their families. Verse 4, Brother Ken. All right. They had to borrow money. They had to borrow money for food and to pay taxes. How many realize taxes are not anything new? Taxes here, they wanted to borrow money for food and to pay taxes. And Kurt, finish up. Read verse 7 through 10 for me, if you would. Very good. Thank you, Kurt. I appreciate that. That'd be all of our reading for, at that time. Nehemiah simply said this in a passage. He says, I want you to back off of my people and let them go. I believe today we have too much of a communistic, socialistic mentality. I believe if a, a, the Bible says if a man doesn't work, they should move. And I, I, I believe we should help someone out that got on hard times, maybe can't make ends meet. But the problem I have, I believe the Bible teaches, if a person can work and chooses not to, that's when problems come. I believe that everybody should, be, according to the application of the New Testament, should carry the load, equality, should be a help in our country. What President John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what can you do for your country? You can break it down for the church. Ask not what your church can do for you, but what can you do for your church? And that is everybody. Everybody can, you know, everybody can do something. How many of you get? You met, pastor says, you know what? I can't finish my sermon tonight. I need somebody to step up to the plate here and finish it for me. I wonder how many of you say, yeah, Pastor, I'll do that. I'll finish it for you. I don't know what I'm going to say, but I'll help. I wonder how many could, would. I want to do it. I wonder how many would say, you know, Pastor, I want to, I want to teach a class. And I want to give, I want to give Barb a break out there from the little ones. She's always getting, I want to, I want to teach a class again. And some of you maybe could preach. Some of you maybe could teach. Honestly, no, Pastor, I would love to sing. I would make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Some of you could do that. So you play an instrument. Somebody can help clean the church, mow the grass, or whatever. You know, we can all do something. That's equality. Just like one person shouldn't do everything. If we can get a Heritage Baptist Church family full of people that would tithe, to get an amen on that, everybody tithe, nobody miss a church service, wouldn't that be great? Nobody in the Heritage Baptist Church membership list would miss a service until Jesus comes. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing? 
Not only did you tithe, you wouldn't miss a church service when you came. Every time the pastor said something good, you'd shout a loud amen. And you'd be shouting the whole sermon, would you not? Thank you. You'd be faithful at every service. You wouldn't miss a tithe. You'd be shouting. You'd be, you'd be hanging on the edge of your seat. He'd preach on something, and you'd take it out, and you'd tell everybody you knew what he had to say. You'd go to school or work tomorrow. Do you know what preacher preached on? He talked about abortion on Sunday morning. He said, you know, our government taxes us too much on Sunday night. And you glean from the Word of God. You'd be obedient, faithful, tithing, prayer warriors for the living God. And you'd be the best Christian that you can be. Amen? Equality. If everybody did our part. Man, we'd be super soldiers for the King of Kings. Amen? Amen. Let's stand if we can tonight. I'll close it on that. Dear God in heaven, we love you so much. We thank you for the cross of Calvary. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your faithfulness in taking care of all of our needs. You promised us in Philippians 4.19. You'd meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We know you'll take care of us. You'll take care of the sparrows. You'll take care of yours. I pray, dear God in heaven, that every one of us would be faithful to you and your financial program of tithing and giving our offerings to you and our, our local storehouse, our local church. I pray, dear God, we'll take what was preached this morning, what was preached tonight, and we take it to a, a lost and dying world. One, we'll take it to others that we glean upon what we've heard today and that we would be better Christians for it. We thank you for the privilege and freedom to come into your house today two times. And I pray you'll bring us all back safely on Wednesday night to learn more from your word. Thank you most of all for the class of Calvary. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Good to be in God's house again. Look at someone next to you. Give them a comment. I love you and you are dismissed.